What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 696 of The O Show uh, here in Las Vegas, Nevada at Overdub Studios here with uh, Travis Chapel for up, the dude? first time ever. First I'm time. so glad we were able to finally set this up. It worked out, man. Yeah, finally. So we have a lot out. of mutual connections. Like everybody that you had at your at your dinner party, whether it be like Johnny D, Van Vliet, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brandt, uh, Steve Sims. I'm like, I've connected with all of them except Travis. That's and they all hilarious. have nothing but nice things to say about Travis. You just had Tori <laughs> Gordon, a friend of mine the other day yeah. on your show. So I'm, I'm glad we were finally able to do this because you're a guy, like I'm an interviewer at heart. This is all I've ever wanted to do. Yeah. You're deep into that space of not only interviewing people and having very intelligent and fulfilling conversations, but you're also working, um, you know, with your own brand and getting people booked on other people's shows. Like when I reached out this week, I got the automated message from, what is it? Guestio? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Guestio Mm -hmm. where you're helping people kind of get scheduled on other people's shows that they want to be on. Yep. Yep. Which is an amazing concept in this day and age for everybody that has their own show and wants to be booked on people's shows. Yeah, dude. Basically everything that I'm doing now has all been a direct result of starting a podcast and then listening to what people but listening to what people's problems were. Yeah. And then like every business that I've started since I started my podcast came came from that. It came from just hearing what problems were happening in the industry and trying to figure out a creative ways to solve those problems. And that's where that's where Guestio came from for sure. So you're a guy who comes from the sales world. Yes. And yeah. then started your own show based on off obviously all the experiences that you've had and based on, you know, the big podcast wave that's happened over the last several years Mm -hmm. but like you're really good at interviewing like have you you. have you taken it like have you almost looked at it from like a journalist perspective like man i should have done this at the start like this is this is a lot of fun you know uh i i at the beginning had no idea that that was even a skill set that you had to learn you know i just it just it seemed easy you know And, and you don't realize how difficult it is until you actually start trying to have conversations with people especially if it's any sort of long form conversation yeah uh, and so at the beginning I, I was, I was, I was dog shit, dude. So it was bad. You know what I mean? It just wasn't good. I don't know. Can I hear you? Like you can say whatever you want, man. I was dog shit too. I didn't even know how to edit my shows. There'd be so yeah. much dead air. I'm just like, yeah. welcome back to the podcast guys. Right. Uh, <laughs> exactly. 15 seconds of saying nothing. And yeah. then like those episodes are still out there today. Yep. Exactly. You know? So are mine. Yeah. So are mine. I, yeah, just, uh, I started, started getting into it and realizing it was going to be really difficult. And to be fair, what, what ended up happening was like the, the show I was modeling my show after was John Lee Dumas's Entrepreneur on Fire. And on his show, he basically has like the same, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I think his format's different now, but back in the day, it was like he did seven days a week and it was like the same five questions on every show. And so I kind of mirrored that a little bit and I was like, I want to do longer episodes. I don't want to do like the 15 to 25 minute ones that he's doing. I'd rather do 30 to 40 minutes. So I just had 12 questions that I figured out, ask people, but you don't realize how much work goes into the interim between the questions or how do you transition from question to question Mm -hmm. or what happens if they have a really, really short answer to a question that I thought that they were going to take five minutes to answer. And now I got to come up with another question. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many things, so many variables that I was absolutely not considering when I started, but has become a a huge part of the process and something that I'm, I'm uh, really thankful to have been able to work on because it's a skill that I think directly translates to multiple aspects in life. You know, the quality of your life is largely dependent upon the quality of the questions that you ask yourself because you know, we are a combination of the thoughts that we think and the actions that we take and the actions that we take are usually a result of the thoughts that we think, you know, and all thought is, is a series of questioning yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what thought, is predicated upon mm-hmm. is asking yourself questions. So, you know, asking yourself a different question can sometimes be the difference between making it and not making it. So I think that the skill set of asking good questions is a better way to build a relationship with yourself, better way to understand who you are, better way to get clarity for your future. And it also helps communication with others, wh- whether that be a romantic relationship or a business relationship or a friendship. Asking good questions is a, is a really you know a bedrock foundational piece of building good relationships mm-hmm. uh, because. Uh, because people like to talk about themselves and if you know if you learn if you get to learn how to ask really good questions then you can i think uh, influence and persuade in a way that's uh, more effective than most forms yeah. of of influence and persuasion well how much easier is life knowing how confident you are walking into a room like i could talk to anybody yeah I, i'm curious mm-hmm. right off the bat you know mm-hmm. like they could be like oh hey nice to meet you Oh, what's going on with you? Like nothing much. It's like, I could still, I could still break through that barrier. Well, it's your job. Yeah. It's your job. You're like, you're a content extractor. 
you know, you're an answer extractor. That's what you are, you know? So yeah, it, it's very helpful in those situations and in, in almost all of them. Yeah. And every interviewer will tell you, you've probably done it too. I know Chris has done it. When you're first starting out, like you have your questions lined out, like mm -hmm. you were saying, mm -hmm. like your guest might go on a five minute rant on one of your questions and then answer two other questions. And you're yeah. thinking like, oh God, oh God, oh God, like, <laughs> yeah, what am I right, going to say? Right. And then the only way to go through that is to learn it, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like when I started my show, I was 17, total introvert, couldn't get two words out of my mouth every single day, talking to my parents, like I couldn't do it. Yeah. And then, but I always wanted to be a talk show host for whatever reason, that was the thing for me growing mm -hmm. up. I'm like, I always wanted to do broadcasting. I was say, did you, did you watch some people do that? Like there were people oh, you were looking up to that- I, I grew up in Jersey, so I was a huge New York Yankee fan. I'm like, they get paid to call the games and analyze the games. I want to do that. And then once That's I fair. turned 17, I'm like, well, I could do my own podcast because nobody's going to tell me I can't do that. No like, I can answer. hire myself yeah, to do that. Exactly. And then when I told myself that, I'm like, I remember thinking the first day I started, I'm, I'm going to do this to the day I die because yeah. I, I want to be a talk show host. Wasn't even thinking about making money doing it or the business. I had no business sense at 17 anyways. Yeah. I'm like yeah. I'm just going to start it and reach out to people and hopefully they'll come on and yeah. I'll learn as I go, you know, because when you first start, you think you're going to be great at it. <laughs> yeah, you realize looking back at content the first two, three years, I'm like, man, I was, I sucked. Yeah. It's interesting you brutal. say two or three years, man, because I get, I get that question sometimes. Um, you know, the difference between people who make it and don't make it. And it's always just the people who make it are willing to stick in the longer. And uh, that was interesting. Uh, do you know Eric Sue? Of course. Uh, Co-host of Marketing School, host of Leveling Up. He, great dude. I, I was watching uh, him the other day. He was saying something about uh, that he tells people, I think three years is like the minimum. If you're going to start, if you're going to start trying to build a media company as a part of your brand building, media company, meaning, you know, you're blogging, you're putting out content on social, you're putting out a podcast or doing YouTube, you're doing some sort of like media consumption for the purpose of building your brand. Mm -hmm. He's like, expect three years of nothingness, being consistent and putting out high quality stuff for three full years before anything starts to work for you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's really good advice. I, I had been telling people two years. He's telling people three years. I saw Lewis Howes um, say something the other day that uh, he was saying two years, minimum two years, give it two years. So it's funny you say the first two or three years, everything sucked. And it's, just, I, it, it's, it's rec a recurring theme, it seems, with most people mm -hmm. that I'm talking to that if, you're, if you want to be successful doing this, it's probably going to be a few years of yeah. just not being good. And, mm -hmm. and not only is it okay, but it's expected. Yeah. And I got lucky too, because throughout college, I was working odd jobs. I was doing play-by-play -play commentary. I was working oh, at nice. baseball stadiums, like living it up. Like I wasn't even thinking about monetizing the show. Yeah. That's just not where my brain was. It took me until like, I think when I graduated college, a few different companies came to me. They're like, we'll throw X amount of dollars at you just to promote us at your studio. I'm like, hmm. oh, this is a business. Yeah, and that's when right. it clicked for me. So I got very lucky in the sense of, I started it not with the expectation of making money. That's where yeah. people fall out of place. Because what the average episode or the average podcast lasts seven episodes. Yeah, yeah. That's so short. Yeah. That, Seven weeks for people that are probably putting out one episode a week. Like, that's why. That's why we want, we work with uh, in my production company. We work with people and help them launch their shows. And we won't launch a show unless they've already recorded a minimum of twelve episodes. Yeah. So we're like, we're gonna at least get you past this part. <laughs> we're like, no, these shows aren't making it past seven. We're gonna make sure that you have at least twelve recorded before we even launch the show. Mm -hmm. We have one client right now that's coming close to forty episodes in the can without you know having launched yet. Really. Uh, but that will automatically separate him from the rest of the pack because most people quit before 40. Mm -hmm. He's probably know. already invested in it. Like, let's go. Oh, this totally. is awesome. Completely invested. Just repetitive. Like once you get to that point, you're like the conversations I'm having, like yep. my social skills are improving. Like yep. I feel confident sitting down with virtually anybody, Yeah, you know, like you've had, we talked about Brian Callen beforehand, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, like mm -hmm. big people who have done billions of interviews and you're thinking to yourself, how do I measure up? Yeah, just right. Ask the questions you want to ask right? That you think would provide value to your specific audience. Yep. And like at the end of the day, it's like you have the person, everybody knows who they are. Ask, ask them stuff they haven't heard before. Yeah. That's, that's how you build the relationship. That's the main thing that I try to focus on for sure is try to get stuff out of people that most people don't get. And if I can, if I can do that, that's a successful interview to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, and it's difficult too, especially like people who will say that they've interviewed like Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer Lopez has done billions of interviews yeah. and she's probably not going to be excited to do any of them. Even if she hasn't heard the question before, she's just like, right. all right, another interview, another mm -hmm. interview. Ask something that you're curious about. Be thoughtful. Kind of like I'll 
take bits and pieces of other interviews and ask try to ask questions within the questions that were asked mm-hmm. on a Joe Rogan mm-hmm. or on Travis Chappell show or Chris Van Vliet show, you know? Yeah. And you kind of take bits and pieces. It shows how much effort that you put into it. And then they realize like th- this guy is taking it seriously. Absolutely. That's really the big thing, dude, is that people get wrapped up in the numbers and, oh, my, my show's Nobody not cares. big enough and blah, blah, blah. It's not really a factor of that. I tell people all the time, it's not a factor of how big your show is. It's a factor of, are you going to waste people's time? Mm-hmm. And if people can tell that you're not wasting their time, they're happy to 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 do stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like they, they they're much more likely to say yes, of course, if you have a massive show. But if you don't have a massive show, that's not the barrier to prevent you from getting the people that you want to have conversations with. A lot of them are freely giving of their time. They just only give their time to people who aren't going to waste their time. Yeah. So yeah, you, to your point, I, anytime I bring on somebody who's been interviewed a bunch, I do a good amount of prep to make sure that I'm going to provide an interesting and unique conversation that they have not had, you know, previously, hopefully at all, but definitely previously recently, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing a, a better job than most people are. Um, and I think that, I think that it shows, I think that the audience likes it. I think mm-hmm. that the guest, you know, I always know it's a good when the guest tells me, first of all, you know, nobody's talked to me about this before, but also second of all, when they're like asking me for the content from the episode so that they can share it. That's You huge, know what I mean? Right? When it's like, hey, when is this coming out? Hey, can you send me that? Oh, can we share that? You know, can, can we take that episode and share it on my podcast? Because, you know, no one's ever asked me those questions before. Like, That's when you're that's just great. like, yeah. Yeah, right, right. I remember that was my goal a few years back even to this date, but a few years back when I started getting good at it, a few people were telling me that like, oh, Mm -hmm. no one's ever asked me that before. I'm like, I got to get that response at least once per episode. Yeah, that's the goal. I got that from, I got it twice in one episode the first time I ever talked to David Meltzer. I'm like, this guy does interviews all the time. Like he's always carving out for people. He says yes to almost everybody. Right. I'm like, I got that twice for a guy who's probably heard every question about his career and about his livelihood. I'm like, okay, like I'm confident in this. Mm -hmm. I can go into any conversation. I know like, just be curious, be myself. Yep. And at the end of the day, to your credit, numbers don't matter starting out. I wanted yeah. to be a talk show host. I still just want to be a talk show host. Yeah. You know? Numbers will come if you're good and if it's meant for you. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're 23. Yeah. And you, this is how many? 600 six. So, I mean, you fast forward by the time you're, I'm, I'm 30. So if you fast forward another seven years of doing a couple episodes a week like this, like you have 2000 interviews under your belt. How much more likely are you to be able to get a hosting job somewhere? That's right. If like, if you re- like, at some point you may just be like, "Yeah, fuck it, I'm, I'm making way too much money podcasting. Mm-hmm. Good luck matching what I make," you know. Mm-hmm. But even if that doesn't happen, you're way more likely to get the job than somebody else who's put in zero hours That's or right. who's trying to put in hours at the station or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh well, they're interning, but yeah, now they they have three hours of experience, and it's like, look, I've done two thousand interviews. Yeah, you know, that's the I mean? difference like, between someone who's like doing it for the job and someone who's doing it because it's like it's their identity. Sure, like I feel like this show has been my identity the last six seven years that I've been doing it. Yeah, it's a part of my life, and I never want to stop doing it, no matter how hard. It's it gets. definitely how I feel for sure. It's like even if my I sold my businesses and all that, that's why we, we rebranded the show recently instead of it's called Build Your Network for five years, and now it's called um, Travis Makes Friends. Yep. The reason we did that rebrand was that I wanted to start doing what I really wanted to do with the show rather than doing it for a specific niche or category or purpose or like, or, you know, saying, oh, we, we got, we have to talk about this because this is what the business is built off of and it's going to bring in clients and leads for us. I just said, you know what? Fuck all that. Stop with the noise. Stop worrying about bringing in clients on it. I just want to have a good time doing my show for now. And so we've rebranded and now I talk to whoever I want to talk to. It's not purely in the entrepreneurship business world. Um, And I get to talk about what I want to talk about and things that are interesting to me. And that version of the show will exist for a long time because I enjoy it. It's not, Mm -hmm. yes, it makes money, but enjoying it is more important to me than making the money. Yeah. You know, and And that's why you're making the money. It's because you were enjoying it to begin with. Oh, I wouldn't, yeah, I would have never gotten to the point where I could sell sponsors for my show had I not enjoyed it because it was like three years of not having enough numbers to get sponsors for my show. So yeah, I would have quit before then if I didn't, you know, enjoy it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I'll, I'll do my show for an infinite period of time as of right now, yeah. you know, I was, you know, I never say never and uh, try not to say always and stuff like that, but yeah. I, I think I'll have it going for a really long time because it's just really fun. And, and it, it, the like the best, like a fantastic case scenario for me is 
is to get my show up to a seven figure uh, business by itself, just on sponsorships yeah. and affiliates. Um, and then, and then be able to exit some of the business ventures that I'm in, um, or bring on our, uh, pa partners and operators in those businesses and just like focus on, on focus building on the what show. you love, dude. Yeah. Making a ton of money doing what you love. That's little to no work providing yep. an income for your family, your children, children's children. One's yep. one day, you know, like you could probably look at that stuff down the line. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's the, I like being in vehicles side hustles, hobbies, whatever you want to call them. I like being in opportunities that do not have to be the ultimate fulfillment of what it could be in order for me to still have enjoyed it. But they do have the potential upside to be the unlimited potential if it ends up working out. Does that make sense? So like for instance, if you're if you're doing like garage sale stuff and you're flipping stuff at garage sales, Unless you're going to build a massive company and organization with teams of people getting grot, like it's just not going to be something yeah. that that's that has this unlimited upside potential. It's great for side hustling. You can flip some couches, make a couple thousand bucks a that's month, right. and like you know, it's it's gonna it's gonna be pretty good. But the thing that I love about doing a podcast is that even if it never becomes a seven figure or eight figure thing by itself, it still makes sense for me to take my time to do it because the relationships I get from it are incredible. Um, the knowledge that I get from it is insane. It's like a perfect personal development accountability partner because it's always forcing me to continue learning and growing and and, uh, and questioning my own opinions. Like there's something about throwing your opinions out online that makes you really have to at least feel some sort of confident or or strongly about this particular perspective yeah. because you're throwing it out there and there could be a bunch of people who are looking at it and going like this guy's an idiot you know what i mean and so and like, your you, reputation you, is yeah you just got to know why like you just have to ha you, you ha you're forced to study more you're forced to research more you're forced to learn more you know at least i am anyway because i feel I, I owe it to my audience if i have influence i owe it to them to provide the best possible information that i can provide so if i'm talking about something that I know nothing about, I will research it more before I talk about it, mm -hmm. or I'll bring on somebody on who knows more about it and ask them questions about it. You know what I mean? I feel like I owe that to my audience. So it's it's a perfect accountability partner because it, it forces me to continue learning and growing. So my point is like, I'll do the podcast for all of those reasons, but it's awesome that if I continue doing it and it keeps going well and we keep investing into it and things like that, that it could also be a seven or eight figure brand by itself. You know what I mean? That's the stuff that I like. It's like the stuff that's still worth it. It makes money now, but it does have the potential for unlimited upside. That's right. Because the unlimited upside in this case too is not just sponsorship revenue. Okay. If your show gets big enough to be making a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a month in sponsorship revenue, then you have a good brand that's being built off of the back of that. And as we've seen with The Rock with Terramana Tequila or Ryan Reynolds with Aviation Gin or Ryan Reynolds with um, Mint Mobile yeah. um, or George Clooney with Casamigos or any of these other um, celebrities that are creating these brands that they're building and selling for more than all the money that they've ever made in their career combined. You know what I mean? That's built off of the back of their brand. And obviously, if I'm a podcaster that's making a couple hundred grand a month, I'm nowhere near as famous as The Rock, who has 320 million followers on Instagram or whatever yep. it is now. You know, I'm nowhere near that famous, but I don't have to be. You know, like no, like you know. my tequila, like if I started a tequila brand, whatever, with uh, you know, 200,000 listeners of my show, you know, it's like it's not gonna it's not gonna be a deca billion dollar company like Terramana probably is going to be, but. Will it have some sort of immediate success just based on the fact that I have immediate distribution with an audience of people who know, like, and trust me already? Yeah, mm -hmm. it will have some immediate short-term success. Mm -hmm. That way it's like, then it's on me. If, it's a, if I build a crappy product, then they probably won't order it again. Mm -hmm. If I build a good product and get it in their hands once, they'll probably keep ordering it because they already know me, they like me, and they trust me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's, it's a matter of scale at that point. So it's not even just the direct success that the show would bring in terms of monetary value on itself, the sponsorships, you know, affiliates or whatever else. It's also the brand that's built behind the show that becomes a distribution engine to mm -hmm. allow me to start whatever company I want to start that's at least in some way congruent with the audience that I've built 
off the back of the brand. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Say like so, 200,000 people turns into 2 million people quickly because all those people are telling their friends. Like if it is a great product and the sure. foundation is built on right. Travis Chapel, like the human being, like we like Travis, we trust Travis, his product is great. Yeah. Well, I'll give you Everything a great example. Um, do you know uh, Pat Flynn? Yeah. Yeah. So Pat's got a great show called Smart Passive Income. Yep. He's been blogging since like 2007 or something. And then podcasting since like 2010, 2011, one of the kind of pioneer type of a guy gets, you know, he's over a hundred million downloads on his show at this point, I, probably more than that now. That was a few months ago. Um, but anyway, he, he, you know, makes several million dollars a year from his online brands and businesses. He's got a, lots of blog traffic, a good podcast listener base. He's got, I don't know, quarter million plus subs on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I love the way that he does business because he's very much this way. And a couple of years ago, he came out with this product because he was getting into the YouTube space. So like he first crushed blogs and then he focused on podcasting. And then a couple of years ago, he's transitioning to YouTube and he noticed that everybody's walking around with these gorilla pods, the, the big clunky, um, uh, you know, right. adjustable yeah. tripods that you can like form around something or you that set it take down. take like 50 minutes to learn if you've never picked one up yeah, before. But, and, 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 and a lot of people, and for their, their main purpose, they were really good. But yeah. what Pat noticed was that there was a lot of vloggers who were just using them, like bunching up the legs together like that, and then like curving it a little bit and using it as like almost like a DSLR yeah. selfie stick tripod. And, but then when you go to set it down, the legs are all forming. So you got to like, you got to move it out right. and it's, and then it's not level. And, and there's, there's just a lot of problems with it. It's bulky yeah. in your hand. So Pat goes out and uh, decides to uh, come up with this physical product. He'd never made a physical product before. Everything that he'd done, it was digital courses, coaching, um, a couple software uh, tools that, that he had built. Um, everything he'd done was digital info products stuff, you know, based. So he goes out and builds what he called the switch pod. And, uh, was just, it was a, a tripod that was made for vloggers to do selfies with the DSLR on the top of it. Um, so you can bunch the legs together and then with a flick, you flip them all out and now you got a tripod and it sits down and then it's really easy to collect them, hold it. And it feels better. It's lighter weight. It's easier to, easier to maneuver. It was a, it was a great product that he built. They, they launched a Kickstarter campaign to fund the first initial order because they, you know, they came up with the prototypes, but they, then, you know, the prototypes are costing way too much money because obviously they weren't, they didn't build the mold in the manufacturing plant. So this was like to get their first initial order of brand new uh, product shipped in. And they're like, we need a hundred thousand dollars through this Kickstarter campaign in the next 30 days. They did a hundred thousand dollars in 24 hours. And over the course of the Kickstarter campaign, they reached almost a half a million dollars in pre-orders for a product that a lot of the people ordering didn't even need. I was like, bro, how many people do you think ordered this that didn't need the tripod? He was like, I don't know the answer to that. Probably a good amount because I had people reach out and telling me that they ordered multiple tripods just to support me and the launch. And it was like, a, again, it's a scale thing. You know, The Rock has Terramana and that's a decabillion dollar company. But here's a independent content creator with a couple hundred thousand people who listen to his show or follow him on YouTube or on his email list or read his blog or whatever, but he's built such a great relationship with them over time that there's people that they don't have any use or need for the product. And they bought four of them and spent 800 bucks during his launch just to be like, Hey, thank you for all the value that you've given to me over yeah. the years. Let me help you and support this thing for you. You see the same thing with Gary Vee. That's why every book Gary Vee launched, like Gary Vee has written more books than he's read, admittedly, by his own words, you know? All of them are New York Times bestsellers yep. because all he does is add value to his audience all day, every day. And then like three times a year, he has a big ask, you know? Like lately it's been V Friends or VCon or whatever, but before it was like, hey, I got a book coming out. And then all of a sudden you have people who he's never even talked to, but they've consumed hours of his content that are buying bulk orders of a thousand books and spending $34,000 just to support and add value to a guy who's been taking time to add value to them because he built the audience, yep. the distribution engine. Mm -hmm. So these examples exist across like multiple regards. Obviously look at Joe Rogan with on it. You know, you look like there's just so many examples now of people that are taking their personal brands and not monetizing directly with sponsorships and affiliate deals and, uh, you know, traditional, traditional ways of monetizing a brand, they're taking that and they're using that as the distribution engine to start something that's the, has the ability to scale beyond their ability to scale that thing. So even Logan Paul and KSI yeah. started prime, um, um, right. uh, 
not energy drinks, just like sports drinks. Yeah. Let's compete with Gatorade. They had a quarter billion dollars their first year. A quarter They're billion like the dollars. Official, the official drink of the UFC, right? Of the UFC. Yeah, yep. They've made deals with, uh, there was another big one too that I saw recently. I forget what it was, but they made another deal recently sure where they became- sure WWE in some facet. It's got to be. If it's the, not, it's got to be on the table. You know. Well, I think, didn't UFC and WWE just come to a big deal? And Endeavor owns both companies. Endeavor owns both of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Endeavor's massive. That's like over $40 billion. Yeah. Endeavor is in wild two. that what they did, they, what they were able to do with William Morris and- uh, merging those companies, going public, and mm -hmm. now acquiring UFC and WWE, like they're they're massive entertainment. Those are two huge global juggernauts. Too. Oh yeah, for sure. And two completely different ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah. But look at Dana White and look at Vince McMahon. Just yep. two crazy SOBs who yep. figured it out on two totally ends of the spectrum, and now Endeavor's got both of them. Yep. yep. Which is absurd. But yeah, all that to say that that's that's why I like. You know that's why I like podcasting because it's just yeah. it, there. There is potential for an outsized return if you keep doing it, and even if that outsized return doesn't come, I am a okay with because like the mid-sized return that I'm yeah. getting right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you're getting the fulfillment doing it at the beginning. Anyways. Yeah, and all the benefits are it's it's not even just fulfillment; it's the benefits we talked about. Yep. You know, like there's just so many reasons to keep doing it. So why stop? And when you build such a, a pure and genuine reputation with people not just your audience but like people you'll invite on the show you've probably had it almost every single time where they're just like oh dude i gotta introduce you to my friend and then mm -hmm. they introduce you to someone and all of a sudden your network's just expanding full of people who not necessarily think exactly like you do but like you and chris van vliet probably get along like two peas in a pod based mm -hmm. on like your knowledge and love for interviewing and podcasting and yeah. everything else that you're growing right yeah. and it's like you're able to find those people who have that specific niche too and surround yourself with people that want to build and grow and help each other out Absolutely. you know like your show isn't joe rogan's podcast you know it's not the number one show in the world but you're able to get big guests like a brian callen or a shaquille o'neal based on re relationships that you've built they're like yeah. oh Shaquille, you got to come on my friend Travis's show. It's right. great. He's a great dude. You'll have a great time. It's yep. like, okay, cool. I'll try it out. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't know if that's exactly how it, that went down. I mean, like, kind of. That's, that, that's, <laughs> kinda, that's yeah. how most of my guests have come on. It's yeah. just like, oh, I know so-and-so. Let me talk to him for you and right. get invited on. And even if they don't make the introduction completely, they will still look and be like, oh, these seven people already know Travis. Or exactly. These seven people have already done the show. So, nah. Exactly. Sure. Let's do it. You know, that, that was my conversation when I had uh, uh, Johnny D, Johnny D Domenico on my oh, show. Yeah, nice. I'm just like, yeah, I'm headed to the the dinner party. I'm like, oh, with, with oh, that Travis. Really? I'm like, okay, <laughs> I got to meet Travis and I got to reach funny. out to him. Because <laughs> literally all those guys, I had Chris on who I think when I, I had Chris in here back in January and he was going straight to your house to do your show right oh, after. Gotcha. And then Johnny D nice. was the same way. And Brant was just like, oh yeah, I just did that dinner party with Brant, Travis like yeah. the Brant. Brant from Vidic. Yep. Um, and then Steve Sims, I still got to connect with out here. Just trying to schedule that one. But yeah. you were posting uh, uh, content with him recently, just about yeah. some crazy stories. It's like, yeah, good thing that this is never, this isn't being recorded. This yeah. isn't <laughs> Sharing some business yeah. insight, you know? Steve's a funny guy, man. Yeah. But like, those are, that, like, that's the concept to me. Like, how did you come up with Dinner Party and kind of the concept for Because obviously you've seen things like that. Like, Kevin Hart's got like his wine, like his winery show that he did on either Peacock or Netflix for mm -hmm. a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like, people have that concept where it's more of just like a dinner it's a hangout you guys are playing cards against humanity you guys are yeah you guys are just kicking back having a drink or two sharing experiences like where'd that all come for the idea the idea was that i wanted to continue interview, interviewing people but i wanted to do it in a way that was different unique that nobody in the in the industry was doing and something that something that even if it didn't get a ton of views at first people would still be willing to share a bunch that especially the guests that came on just because of the production value that went into it because we never really done anything that was high production value we just yeah. do a podcast um and the first couple of years of the podcast it was audio only and i was of using course. like a 60 dollar usb mic plugged directly into my computer there's nothing special i used about to use my value. ipad to record using the voice memo app and then my phone to call my guests yeah that there you go it. yep so yeah very low production value to start so this this is one that we were like what uh, let's let's make this as much like a TV show as we can. And I, yeah, just had the kind of the crazy thought of like, it's cool to interview one really high level person at a time. What would be really cool is if I could interview five really high level people at and one time. And then you're all just conversating. And then the, con yeah, exactly. It was basically like the idea behind it is like, people like listening to podcasts because it feels like you're a fly in the wall in an in intimate conversation. 
it doesn't feel like you're watching a live show or you're watching a performance. It just feels like you're you're hanging out with the host and their guest and chilling in the same room. You're just kind of you're just kind of in the other seat without a microphone listening in on the conversation. And so when the idea of the idea for dinner party was that I I was I've been hosting these dinners for the last couple of years where I'll just bring out interesting people and you know had the uh, former CEO of Chipotle, uh, Monty Moran, who took it from like you know nine stores to thirty billion dollar market cap, or whatever it was when he resigned, um, who came out and did a Q and A with us, and we've had just an interesting group of eclectic you know people. If you like add up the total revenue of all the people we've had at our my dinner parties over the last few years, it's into the the billion dollar mark. You know, it's like there's just a good number of people I'm able to connect with, and I was just like. Be cool to put all these people in a room. Like they're they're clients of mine, they're past guests of my show, they're investors in my company. Let's put all these people in a room together because good stuff comes out of that typically. And the conversations in those rooms were just so incredible that I was like, I wonder if there's a way that we could package this and share it with people. So it was kind of all of that stuff combined that made me go, what if I hosted a dinner party with five awesome guests at once? I ask them questions, it's structured like a show, but then there's also just kind of this natural downtime where we're just picking up, we're just recording conversations that are happening at this really organic type dinner party. And then it makes it feel like, again, you're, you're like the fly on the wall in a conversation in the studio, you're a fly, like you're invited to the dinner party and you're sitting there with me and five other guests and you get to listen in on the conversations that, that are, that are being had mm -hmm. conversations that people would charge thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to be a part of. Um, so that was kind of the concept behind the show. So we launched the first episode. We still have not, full disclosure, recorded a second episode. Um, I, I assume at this point we'll probably do like one every couple of months uh, because- Different people or same people? Different people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's what makes it so difficult. It's, it's just really difficult. It, it's, it's hard enough to coordinate. To, I mean, yeah. you know, it's hard to coordinate one busy person's schedule, but to coordinate five busy people's schedules to come at one time. And we we filmed for four hours. So it wasn't like a small, it's not like, oh yeah, stop by the studio for 30 minutes on your way to the airport. You know, it's like, you got to be here. You got to be here for three or four hours while we film. And not only do you have to be there, but four other really high level people with busy schedules also have to be here. So mm -hmm. the scheduling has been a nightmare and a half to work through. Um, but I think um, there's one or two that I, we have on the, that we've been like talking to of, of guests that are going to be freaking killer. So I, uh, I'm very excited to continue recording those and I'm hoping yeah. that we can close, close in on a couple of these people that we that were. No, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the content that you've put out so far, at least the first time around with those guys, just Thank a you, good group of guys. John's awesome. Chris is the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. You know, Steve's out there just spewing all of his yep. cool stories. Brant's awesome too, in his own right. It was and a really great eclectic group, yeah. you know, to, to put together for the first one that, I was grateful that they were all able to make it out. There was a couple of last minute cancellations and we had a couple of last minute fills and everybody was like, it was just, it was just a great group, a really yeah. easy going group, but all with interesting stories, funny presentations, different things to talk about. So, um, yeah, it, from John Domenico doing, you know, Trump impersonations to, um, to Brandt talking about reality TV and Chris talking about interviewing the rock and the other John talking about his real estate group and then being a contestant on The Apprentice. And, you know, it was just that everybody that we had there had something unique and interesting to bring into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it ended up going pretty well. Oh my God. And that's something that you don't find out until you're actually shooting with a bunch of different personalities that yeah. worked in similar spaces, all in entertainment, sales, mm -hmm. production, everybody kind of has the same understanding of how hard it is. Like I told you before we went live here, yeah. this is the first weekend I feel like ever where I God threw me a bone and everything went according to plan. Like all my guests showed up on time. There were no last minute cancellations. I didn't have to rush. I've, I've flown out here before and had three get like I'm here for three guests, then I'm flying back. All three cancel at the last oh, second, gosh. you know, and it happens and you got to have that mentality to know this might happen, you yep. know, have a plan B, have a plan C. Worst case scenario, you make the most like, all right, I'm in Vegas for the day. What, yeah. what can I do? Who can right. I call? You know, but like there's a lot of people who will quit because of that because mm -hmm. they can't deal with all like the different people and their schedules. And yep. they think like, oh, that was disrespectful. Like, oh, I can't do this. I'm investing so much money into people's this. Get, yeah. People's uh, ego gets, gets in the way too often, mm -hmm. you know, and it just, if you're dealing with busy people, it's going to be part, it's just going to be part of it, you know, and, and you can't, 
it's it's hard to start judging other people for uh for scheduling mishaps unless you've had an insanely busy schedule mm -hmm. that a bunch of people want and a lot of people want your time mm -hmm. it was easier for me at the beginning to be upset with people when that would happen and then and i'm still nowhere near the busiest person of right. all the people I've talked to, but I've gotten pretty busy over the over the last few years, comparatively to when I started, obviously, and I have so much more empathy for it for it now. It's just like, you know, at the end of the day, that person does not owe me anything. Nope, they owe themselves and their family things. Like when it comes to their time, that's right. That's that's it. All the rest of us are subject to what could or could not be happening that day, and uh, I think that if you're gonna Built relationships with high level people, you just gotta understand that sometimes it's gonna be part of it. You're gonna have last minute cancellations, you're gonna have people accidentally ignoring you, you know? Like at first I would think it was intentional. Yeah. And now again, now that I'm getting hit up all the time, I, I just, just stuff slips through the cracks. It's like you don't there's so many mediums, you know. It's like I'm texting some people, I'm messaging some people on Instagram, messaging some people on Facebook, emailing some people, WhatsApp with some people overseas. Like I have so many different messaging platforms. I'm getting so many incoming all the time. It's just it's difficult to not have something fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. But then I know that some people are just like, "Oh, Travis is being a dick. He's just ignoring me. He got too big for his britches." It's oh like, yeah, you've, I swear you've that didn't happen. You probably DM people where they you, you saw that they read it and didn't respond, and maybe like three days later they get back yeah, to you. Right, right. And I've done it with people too and now i have that expectation like maybe they're leaving me on red maybe they'll get back to me yep. in a few days yep. you know you don't know and if not i'll follow up mm -hmm. exactly oh you know? exactly not, until you tell me like get out of here go f yourself i'm going to continue to be persistent Ple pleasantly, pleasantly persistent pleasantly persistent yeah I'm, I'm not a big fan of someone who just like ignores you and, I, and to your credit i don't think people are like that they're yeah. just busy and it falls through the cracks and you forget yeah. sometimes you know, just today, I'm like, oh, I forgot to text someone back from two days ago. Like, yeah, sorry, man. Right, sorry, right. Late, sorry for being late. But you know, like, if you're gonna ignore me, I'm gonna be like, all right, in a few days, I'm gonna reach back out just mm -hmm. to see if that was the case. Yep. Yep. You know? No, same way. Same way. And to your credit too, like, I'm so grateful that I've had 696 different people take the time to come on my show that they probably never heard of before until I sent them the link when I yeah, reached yeah. out and invited them. Like. We they don't owe us anything coming mm -hmm. on our show. Yeah, like we should be grateful that they're even sitting down. That like something didn't come up last minute because totally. you're thinking, especially with big guests. I once had David Ortiz scheduled to come on mm -hmm. the day before. He's like, oh, I can't do it. Yeah, and we never rescheduled. And it's a bummer, but it's like there's he's, a solid, he's got a lot going on. I was gonna say there's a solid half dozen guests that I was stoked about interviewing and that just, just fall through. Never happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was I'm a pretty persistent fellow. And uh, yeah, some of them just weren't meant to happen. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it is what it is, you know? And I just have a, you know, quiet confidence that's just like, hey, one day they're, they'll come on. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, whatever. There's a lot of other people that are also good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to oh, go get, sure. you know what I mean? Just, yeah. yeah. Sometimes my best Hopefully conversations, I think, are, are on days where I didn't want to do it. I'm just like, yeah. mentally things are off. Like I didn't really get off to a great start today. Yeah. And oh, I got a podcast at one. Maybe we can reschedule. And it's like, F it, I'll do it. And then I go in great conversation we'll get lunch afterwards you build a really cool friendship with those people yeah and then you're like that was worth it and that's why i do this yep. you know and then there are times where it's like you you have like a i don't want to call them celebrities but like big people that you're like oh my god i have an opportunity to interview them everything's working out they they gave me the green light and then a couple of days before you're like oh yeah he's not in town anymore yeah. we're not going to do it right if you're lucky it's a couple of days before <laughs> this is the day of you're like waiting 30 minutes studio, before like, yeah, yeah he's not coming yeah. <laughs> and there's times where they're like, yeah, he can come in. And it's like, but what's your budget? Yeah. How much right. are you willing to spend? Then it's like, right. oh, you want 10K for the hour? Yeah. That that was unexpected. Yeah. Right. I've yeah. had people ask like for 10 to 15K and they're not even like quote unquote celebrities. They're still building their brand. And I'm like, yeah, those people are weird to me. I can I get someone way cool, like way if, more. Like if I were going to pay 15 grand. It wouldn't be for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. If right. I had 15 grand to just say like, yeah, sure, here you go. I still wouldn't pay it because yeah. it's like, you're not, right. I don't think you're worth that. Investment. Well, and, and to be fair, maybe those people know that and they just are trying to say no without yeah. saying no. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, it's fair. There's like, yeah, sure. Totally. The best is when the, when the talent tells you definitely, man, talk to my publicist because he doesn't want to oh, be the bad yeah. guy and then the publicist turns you down. Totally. Yep. Or the publicist tells you how much it's going to be yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah how man. how much would you be willing to spend on someone 
Like if someone was just like, we need X amount of money to even entertain the fact for this person to come to one of your dinner parties. It is completely subjective. It's really based difficult on the person. to say. Based on the person, based on uh, if we have an agreement for a promotion, um, based on how bad I want to get other people who maybe know, like, and trust or respect that person. Um, there's a multitude of yeah. factors that would affect how much I'd be willing to pay. Um, I am not opposed to paying at Neither all. Um, there's a lot of people I'm connected with, like starting their own shows and stuff. And granted at my age, people don't have tens of thousands of dollars to throw at people, but sure. they're like, they take great pride in the fact that they've never paid for an interview. Yeah. And like, there are times where I'm like, yeah, like definitely like based on reputation alone, they were able to come on. But like, if it's within reason and I really want, like, it's a dream guest of mine, a bucket yeah. list guest, I'll pay. Yeah. Well, like, no problem. my thing is like, I just don't, I don't understand that the, I don't understand why people are so upset about it. Like, I understand hesitancy to pay for anything because you got to pay rather than not pay. And it seems bad. But in this particular context, it just never made sense to me. Like, I'll, I'll ask somebody, you know, uh, uh, I'll say like, oh yeah. Or somebody will ask me for a connection. And I'm like, uh, yeah, but they charge, you know, whatever. 3,000 bucks or 2,000 bucks or yeah. 5,000 bucks. And like, oh, I'm not interested in paying anything. I don't, I don't pay my guests. I was like, okay. You're not getting them. I was like, okay, cool. Maybe take, like it's, to me, it's a matter of skipping the line or not skipping the line. It's like, you can get them right now for 3,000 bucks or you can organically get them in 22 months from now. Pick which one you want. You know what I mean? If you don't have, if you have more time than money, you'll probably pick 22 months. If you have more money than time, you'll probably pick the 3,000 bucks. Like it's inconsequential either way, mm -hmm. you know, but, you're going to have to spend something. You're not just going to get them. No. And if it is your livelihood, like for us, like this is part of our identity yeah. now, it's like, I'm willing to invest it because I'm not just investing into the show. I'm investing in myself and what I'm building. And I found too, that um, when you pay people, they're more likely to be, to feel good about the conversation, yeah. more likely to help, more likely to promote. And we're going to um, get that value back. Yeah. And then, and so, so the question I asked people was like, okay, if you were putting on an event, would you pay that person to speak? Well, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it's, the same, it's the same thing. Like you're, you're like the reason you have to pay that person to speak at your event is because you do not have a relationship that's good enough with that person for them to come speak at your event for free. The reason you have to pay this person to come on your podcast is that you don't have a good enough relationship with this person or a big enough show to yeah. get them to come do it for free. So if you want them pay or wait 24 months until you can get them organically. Yep. By the way, I don't care which one you do. Just stop complaining about the fact that some people want money for their hard earned time. It's yeah. just like, it's just to me almost disrespectful. Oh, it's and like, the people that not, are, you're not enough. valuing that person's, that individual's time. If you're, if you're, you know, saying like 5,000 bucks for some people, that's a really, really good deal. A thousand bucks for some people is a really good deal. Like they're, they're speaking fees, 50 grand. So you can get a connection with this person for five by interviewing them on your podcast. And they're going to share it to their audience of 2 million people on Instagram. Like, yeah, doesn't seem like a bad deal to me. <laughs> and for most of these people whose teams are asking for the five grand, the 10 grand for an hour of your time, two hours for a speaking event, whatever, it's because they spent 10 to 20 years doing it for virtually nothing. Yeah, exactly. And now they're getting their, their money back. Based they on deserve to be paid for their time. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're truly if, invested in the business, you should understand that. Yeah, right. No, I, I, it, it is a, it blows my mind because obviously my my company Guestio we do that for people we yeah. help get people booked on stages help people get booked on on podcasts and things like that and uh, yeah whenever I have that just complete aversion to be like they like you said it's like something they take pride in like no 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 I would never pay I would never yeah, pay someone like to come on my show it's like oh I never use steroids yeah it's almost. like like you're acting like this is an illegal act mm -hmm. like this is a very common thing you're paying talent for time because you don't have a relationship with the talent. Yep. It's very simple. <laughs> like that's how the entire talent industry works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You think Ludacris is making a making an appearance at your, you know, at your kid's birthday party because he enjoys by. kids' birthday yeah. parties? Like no, it's cuz you're paying him $400,000 or whatever he charges mm -hmm. to oh, yeah. to come sing two three songs at your kid's birthday party. Mm -hmm. You know, it's probably less than that, but um but yeah, like it just it's part it's part of the part of the deal, you know. So have lower expectations or be okay with the fact that some people you might have to pay for. Mm -hmm. Um I just when when I when when I'm considering paying, I like to look at all the factors. Um it's not going to be somebody who is not strategic there's not a strategic advantage for um so i i'm 
I'm, I'm strategic about that at least is like when I'm paying, there's other factors to consider. Of course. Um, besides, oh, I just want that person. It's mm -hmm. like, well, I want that person, but I'm not, you know, like to your point, a lot of people I'm not willing, I don't want them bad enough to be that to, to be willing to pay for them. Yeah. You're at but, a different stage in life too, where you got a family and kids to think about too. But, but I also don't talk crap yeah. about that person because they had the audacity to charge me for their mm -hmm. time. It's like, okay, well, if that's what you're charging, I don't want to pay that. Congrats on being able to charge that. Maybe we can work it out at some point in the future. Yeah, you have it in the back of your head you know? like, okay, that's the asking price, maybe down the line. Yeah. If it makes sense. Maybe, yeah. If it makes sense, it makes sense. So for dinner party, that's something that we're actively looking at now um, because we have, like, like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to jinx myself yeah. and say the names of the people that we're talking to, but we're talking to a few like, really, really great people for one of our next episodes. So I think that if we can make that one happen organically, we won't really have to invest into yeah. uh, into booking guests uh, for, for dinner party, especially at that particular one. Because once we lock down these two people, we'll fill the rest of the party like yeah. that because everybody They'll will want to the be there. Um, but then it'll also make it easier to book the next party after that. You know what I'm saying? So if we have the credibility of the initial people um, at the next one. So oh, yeah. It's all you know, about continuing see, to do it. And then these big names that you're having on being like, oh, what a great experience. I have that's Travis the big and the gang. So, so you got to uh, do this. Um, so that's what, um, shout out John Gafford, um, who is a owns the Simply Group, which is the largest yeah. or the largest luxury real estate brokerage in, in Vegas. And he was a contestant on The Apprentice, a friend of mine. And that's what he said about Dinner Party. He's like, I've been on, I don't know, hundreds of podcasts I've done, you know, he was on the apprentice. He yeah. was on, like, he'd been on television. He'd been in, on podcasts. He's done media all over PR for different businesses, whatever. And he was like, and, and he literally on social told his audience that he was like, this is the most fun and interesting thing that I have done in a really long time. And I can't wait to see how it how it turns out mm -hmm. you know but that was that was the exact idea it was like when people come do this it it feels like they're on a television show not like they're on a podcast yeah and so it gets them you know more excited to to share so obviously like on camera people are watching and it's supposed to be like a loose fun nature like how structured is it when you guys are actually doing it when you're there it was pretty so i i i wish i made the dinner part of it a little bit more structured so the original idea was that the cocktail hour was very structured yeah. the dinner part was supposed to be free-flowing conversation and then the dessert and games was supposed to be um a longer segment what ended up happening was uh, the first, I think the first segment was probably the best one in terms of quality of content. The dinner ended up going really well. It was just that I, I wish I would have reeled in the conversation a little bit more and steered and directed more questions and been a little bit more purposeful about that time instead of just letting it free flow the whole time. Um, and then the dessert and games, what happened was uh, Cards Against Humanity was just too ludicrous yeah, <laughs> to I'm release. Sure. And he, sure. we filmed for like 50 minutes, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes of of content and we put like two and a half minutes in the in the edit because it was just it was too off the rails to show to anybody yeah, I'm um, sure. you know nobody felt like getting canceled so <laughs> uh, we kept that footage locked away in a vault somewhere um uh but uh but yeah so we learned a lot doing the first one we'll we'll change we'll pick a different game for the next one to to have a little bit better of like a dessert cocktail hour with games at the end um and then and then i'll be a little bit more directed and purposeful during the dinner segment mm -hmm. as well but um, overall though, man, it was just a blast. Like you said, I, I was, I always had like this desire to be on TV when I was a kid, yeah. you know, in, in any capacity, whether that was like acting or hosting or whatever. Yeah. You see how fun it is for them on camera. It's yeah. Like, well, so doing that was, was one of the most fun things I've done professionally, you know, like so far the video has, as of this recording, it, the video has like not even 700 views on YouTube. And we spent six, seven thousand dollars putting it together. That's what it and is. We you're did. investing way more into it than you're getting out of it starting out on any project. Yeah, it was four hours of filming, two months of editing. Like there's a lot of work that went into it for seven hundred views. But to me, it's just like if the content, if we make the content just so good, at some point by dinner party episode nine, people are gonna be like, Have you seen dinner party? Mm -hmm. You know, like there's this one episode with I couldn't believe like those five people were sitting in a room together and I just had to check it out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the goal anyway. So we're we'll, uh, I want to do at least like a dozen episodes yeah. of the show uh before we before we give up on it or not give up on it. 
Um, Who, who's but, like your dream people to have on that you aren't even like remotely close to being in contact with? Because obviously you say like you have one or two guests lined up for this one that could yeah. open the door for a lot more down the road. But do you yeah. have like dream people they've always wanted to interact with? For sure. It, it's more like it's dream mixtures of people. That's what. So one yeah. thing that I I think that I've gotten pretty good at over the years is learning how to put a group of interesting people together. And that is something that's hugely valuable, not just for me, but for the other people in the room. Like that's the goal for the dinner party is like you, you, you're already a high level person, but I'm trying to invite you out to a party where you don't know the other people, at least not more than one or two of them where you were definitely getting like at the end of that last dinner party, it was cool. We should have filmed it just to have it for like social proof. But right after we were done filming and we wrapped up, we'd filmed for four hours, like I said, everybody was sitting in the middle, exchanging numbers and content information yep. and following each other and, and doing collaborations and stuff. And then like two weeks, within two weeks, one of the people there got another one of the people there, a paid speaking gig. And just like, that's what, like, that's why this is good. That's why in my mind, this is going to work. Uh, because it's not just bringing one person in to connect with me. It's bringing one really high level person in to connect with me and this high level person and that high level, that, that high level person. Mm -hmm. These two, these two people knew this person, this person didn't know that person. They didn't know this person. You know what I mean? So all just these like dots are connecting, you know? Yeah. So They're like almost the Rolodex for all of these people to connect with all these different people. Right. It's everybody's. valuable for them still, even if the content doesn't do well, because the connections are that good. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, for me, it became like a, uh, now, now it's not, it's not just like, oh, I want this person to show up. It's yeah. more like, oh, it'd be so cool to put that person and that person and that person in a room together mm -hmm. just to hear the conversation. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the way that I'm thinking about it now. It's more yeah. like mixtures of people rather yeah. than just in particular individuals. Just like odd people to put together or just like, oh, these people I think would have great synergy. Yeah. Like good synergy and, um, kind of different backgrounds. Like, so that's, that's why I wanted John D. Domenico at the first one. Cause yeah. like, he's not a business person. John Gafford's in real estate and Brant's in television production. Yeah. And he's just like, yeah, like three or four people were business people there. Um, but like Chris Van Vliet's an entertainment reporter is not yeah. really a business person. John D. Domenico is a comedian and, uh, an impressionist and the number Everybody one Trump impersonator the in the world. Experience like, with grit though. Yeah, you know right. Exactly. Yeah. No, they're all they're They all have stories of success, but like, I, I like, I like that. I like the idea of having like a motivational speaker, a professional athlete, a comedian, an artist, and a business person in a room. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not just, th there will be some that I'm thinking about that would be like just one industry, you know, dinner party marketing edition yeah. where we just have five expert marketers in the room talking about marketing. But for a lot of them, it's more what I was talking about earlier, which is just like an, a, an interesting group of people mixed together that normally, like it's eye-catching. If you see a picture of them or you see a, a clip on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or whatever, and you see these five people in a room together, you know who all of them or at least two or three of them are, but you've never seen them in a room together. And you're like, wait, what is this? Why are they, why is, you know, reaching for the stars on this one, but why is Joe Rogan sitting next to, you know, Tony Robbins or whatever? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, that's interesting. Who, where did this come from? Why is this happening? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's kind of the the idea behind like it. Like Jennifer Aniston and Ozzy Osbourne or yeah, just, just like, like two, like, oh my God. They're getting along great too. Yeah. Like, what's going on? Right. Yeah. So that's so much that's more in that's uh, that's kind of the idea. No, so. dude, that's amazing. Like we'll see that how, is such a cool, works. such a cool concept. Yeah, I mean, best case scenario, we could get it picked up by an actual, you know, streaming platform or something like well, that. Well, the production value but, is already at that level. I feel right. Like. It, well, it literally is like in terms of the equipment that mm -hmm. we that we used, the gear that we used to to film it. It's like the you know Netflix and all these other platforms have a minimum, mm -hmm. you know standard yeah. of equipment that you need to use in order to oh, of course. be on the platform. So the equipment, everything that we got was all state of the art, you know, really good stuff. Yeah. We, we had three cr crew members in there on lighting cameras, angles, producer, me, and, you know, five guests. And we had a bartender, we had a chef, you know, it was, it was cool, man. It was a lot of fun. Just like fine dining on camera with yeah. some of the coolest, most unique individuals. Yeah. And like to your credit, it's like, yeah, you had 723 views, whatever. Like yeah. that's not the end so of the far. 
Yeah, that's not well, the I, end. I hope that this time next year we're laughing that it only has 700 views and at this time next year it has, you know, 700,000. Right. But, but like the average person <laughs> yeah, will look at that and goal. be like, man, I invested seven grand for 700 yeah. views and that's it. But like, that's not the end I of quit. the investment. Yeah, that's right, not the exactly. end of the investment. Like you said, you have five people sharing their information and they're, that information is going to get out yep. to their audiences and all the people that they're connected to. Right. And like the investment is five, six, seven years down the road when right. it's like, oh, it's a global thing that might be picked up by a network. And all of them went and talked to other people about it. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like it became a topic of conversation for those people. And then the content we've been posting on social, we've been like requesting collabs with everybody. We've been getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of impressions online just from putting out the clips and, and reels and stuff like that from it. So, you know, it, it, Ultimately, I obviously want want it to where it's like people are looking forward to the next time that we were releasing a full episode on YouTube and yeah. they're like tuning it. Like I would love to have a dinner party, like watch party where we send out a meal prep something and people are like preparing dinner in their house and yeah, like watching cool. it, eating dinner, making it like a watch event, um, which is why we likely will never go more than one a month. Like it would have to be wildly successful for us to start doing that thing like once a week. Right. Because so difficult to film. The amount of money you're going to have to invest into it. Right? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Money, but also time. Like I said, people's time. It's so hard to get five people in a room. Yeah. So that's the, that's the most difficult, that's the biggest barrier, not necessarily even the money part. It's, it's the biggest barrier is how can we get five interesting people in a room four times a month? That's really yeah. difficult. So like if the show is massive, it's much easier to get people booked and yeah. they will start prioritizing the show rather than like, oh, I think I'm in Vegas sometime in November, you know right. what I mean? It's like, oh, well, can you be here in July? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I love the, the DMs I get back like, yeah, that sounds great. Next time in town, we'll make it work. I'm like, well, when's the next time you're going to be in town? So I can yeah. get like a gauge of, and then you right. kind of have to like start texting again, but like you're already investing the money. Like that's the thing that will get people kind of riled up and kind of get that stingy feeling is when you're investing 7k into it. And then at the last second, those five guests, like, yeah, we can't make it. And you got to pull an audible and bring other people in. And it's yeah. just like not what you envisioned it. Right. But you're still no. spending the money. You, 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 it's like, uh, it's like a show like hot ones. Yep. You know, when Sean Evans first started that show, I imagine it was extremely difficult to get anybody well known to torture themselves on camera. Yep. But once you get the first couple and people start watching it, and then there's distribution and there's something there, now everybody's yep. eating hot wings with Sean Evans. Yep. You know what I mean? Because he's got whatever, nine million freaking YouTube subscribers. And, and that, every that's an interesting gets 4 one too, because views. like Will Farrell's gonna go back to like John C. Riley and be like, oh, dude, it was torture, but you got to do it. Yeah, it's such right. an interesting thing where it's like, you almost like that brainwashed was, them. Like the experience was so good, but at the same time, like my mouth was on fire. Everybody's got to do it. That was one of the shows that we were definitely modeling or had in mind when we came up with Dinner Party. It was like, there's, there's a, an experiential element to that yeah. that makes it visually interesting and prompts people to share, you know, and ours won't be as, um, as much Torturous. as that, yeah. yeah, right, because we're not lighting people's mouths on fire, mm -hmm. but um, but I still think it'll give that kind of interesting, you know, aesthetic. Who's a guest that you would always want to have on the show that you can never have on because they're either dead or just like they don't do interviews? I mean, I would say Kobe because, yeah, of course. yeah he was, I mean, I played a lot of basketball growing up. Shaq was my favorite player, yeah. full disclosure. So when Shaq and Kobe split, I followed Shaq. Uh, but I still, you know, Kobe was a huge part of my childhood. So was just I've getting never, started I, in business too. Yeah, he was just getting. That, that's it's it's what's so sad about it is that he was one of those guys that you know is about to just crush retirement, mm -hmm. re, quote unquote retirement. Yeah, um, it, yeah, just just terrible. And I, there was one. It was one of those things that that made me really think about how to act with urgency, but still have patience because I knew I was one or two one connection away from Kobe and like four or five different people that I, that I know and that I've been in contact with. And I was always just like, ah, I just don't want to rush it. I'll get him on eventually. I'll get him on eventually. Yeah. I'll get him on eventually. And then it was just like, ah, oh, man, that is yeah. horrible. I've never felt a celebrity death before. You know what I mean? Like typically it's all like, not to say that I'm lackadaisical about it. It's just that I just, you I'm weren't like, as invested in that person. Exactly. At the time, yeah. Right? But with Kobe, yeah. it was just like, a man, I, I felt just, that one. It's a huge yeah. name. I, yeah. I'm a huge Foo Somebody Fighter such a huge fan. Impact, you know? I'm a huge Foo Fighter fan, and their drummer Taylor Hawkins died around this time last year. Oh, okay. And I met him two weeks before he died. No way. Like the thought of that guy just shredding it on a drum kit enters my mind like 12 times a day. Yeah. So when I heard that news, I'm like, 
oh my god yeah that's huge like with kobe I would, i'm not like a huge nba guy but kobe bryant kobe bryant michael jordan lebron james those are the three everybody yeah. talks well, about well they've like, transcended the sport name. yeah they're they're a cultural icon not an nba player yeah you know what i mean yeah and yeah. like the fact that obviously gianna too and like seven other people <sighs> multiple different families devastated by terrible. that like it's just it's terrible un, like that and covid like two weeks after that and everything that transpired a ton of celebrities died in that period too. yeah yeah that was a a year to be forgotten you know <laughs> have you ever interviewed someone that has recently died um i don't know I mean, I've interviewed hundreds of people, so potentially. Yeah. But I, you'd have to go back and think yeah, about it. Yeah. I got I Bob Saget like a month before he died. Really? Yeah. And I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. I yeah. Just talk to this guy. Yeah. That was a crazy one, too. It's always, it's always so telling how somebody chose to live their life when you see the people who spent a lot of time with them all talking so highly of those mm. people. And Bob Saget seemed like one of those guys, just mm -hmm. like, the dad to all of the stand-up comics, the, you know, super, super nice, really down to earth, genuinely helpful, kind human being, you know? So it's, those ones are, those ones are tough. Mm -hmm. And it was as simple as him just like hitting his head on something. And yeah, not it was even something like crazy that like that. He, yeah. He was like bleeding internally. And it's like, you never know. Like, that's just brutal. Yeah. It's like, they always say the good ones die young. Like, it's true. Yeah, there was, uh, it sucks. Um, actually on Fighter and the Kid on Brian Callen, Brent Schaub show, they were showing this clip of um, Bob Saget and uh, Norm Macdonald. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And it was, it was just weird watching the clip and it was just being like two, like they were still both young, rel like relatively 50s, young. Yeah. 56. Uh, Bob, Bob Saget was, was definitely say, in his 60s, 60s, but Norm, I think was in his fifties. Really? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe like 60 Either way. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Either way. Still young. Way too young. And just seemingly the nicest people on the planet but um yeah the clip was still hilarious um oh yeah i, I won't i won't try to i won't try to summarize it but it's hilarious that's the worst when you're like you got to think about this thing and then it's like i can't summarize it at all yeah you're just gonna have to watch it i'm yeah. not doing it justice yeah exactly you know you can't do it you can't do norm mcdonald justice you got to just watch norm mcdonald do norm mcdonald oh yeah he, he was someone who was a part of that class of like sandler farley spade chris mm -hmm. rock like he was just like the the fifth sixth guy that nobody yeah. really knew because he wasn't as famous as everybody else yeah well he's he arguably just, the most he was a stand-up comic at his core, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't do a ton of the movies and stuff. Like he was all, he was always in a, he was always in Sandler movies, you know, like in, he's, a, he's in Billy Madison. Yeah. He's just the guy that gets drunk and lays by the pool all day and has not a lot of lines, yeah. you know, but so he was in a lot of them, but he just, I think he was just like, he was in love with stand up comedy, you know, mm -hmm. and he was so, so good at it. Do you, in uh, everything that you've done, and I'm kind of the same way, because you got to pick and choose guys that are you're both close with and have the same drive and kind of similar frequency as you. But I look at a guy like Adam Sandler, right? He's still best friends with like David Spade, Chris yeah. Rock, Kevin James now. Farley died when he was 33. Yeah. Norm MacDonald till he died. It's like he brought all of his friends with him. Yep. Like he had all that success, but he all brought all of his friends with him in all of his movies. Like he just got... Um, the Mark Twain award, whatever that was. Yeah. And Conan had a big joke being like, you want to know why all of uh, Adam's friends were available to speak tonight? Because when Adam's not working, they're not working, <laughs> you know, but like he, oh, he's so like good. responsible for Conan's like all great. of these guys. He brought all of his friends with him. Like yeah. I'm the same way. Like I want to keep in contact with all of my buddies who are just as driven as I am that yeah. want to break into whatever industry it is and bring them up with me. Yeah. You know? That's something I love about Joe Rogan too. You know, same, I, same I'm, way. I've, I'm a Rogan fanboy for sure, yeah. but uh, so I say positive things about him a lot, but there's just so many things I respect about him. That's one of those things is that he created the biggest platform in the world and never became a douche. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just, he, he's like single-handedly almost completely proven made multiple people's careers, especially in like stand-up comedy. Yeah. Um, in, in that world of the people coming up behind him, he just, he put, if he thinks that you're good, he just, he puts you on and he yeah. shares his platform and he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't have this impossible standard. He never, like I said, he's never, he's never, he never went to his head and he never let it become, you know, something that defined him completely. He just, I think handled it. 
yeah. extremely, extremely well. Well, he'll have his buddies on, like uh, Jim Brewer went on multiple times. He's like, you've never changed. Since yeah. the time I met you when we were 21 years old, like you've yeah. never changed. Like Joe did a guest spot at Stand Up Live in Phoenix, and I have a few local comedian buddies who got the chance to be a part of that show with him and talk nice. to him backstage. And he took him out to dinner afterwards. Yeah. It's like, he didn't have to do that. Like talk about someone who just like genuinely loves what he does. Yep. And he's so invested into stand up comedy and the art of it yep. that he wants to not only learn from these people, but like give pieces of advice to these young kids in their mm-hmm. early twenties who are And put making, them on. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he built that entire comedy club in Austin to do yep. that exact thing. I was listening to Andrew Schultz talk about it the other day and he was just like, he was just, Joe Joe wouldn't let him say exactly what the financial details were, but he was like, Andrew Schultz was like, let's just put it this way. You set this up in a way where you were not going to make any money and you just wanted to help out young comedians. And it just seems like that's the kind of dude that he is, which is, you know, just very respectable. Who's someone in your life personally that's kind of, you've kind of not like modeled yourself after in a way, but like you thought like, oh, I want to be like that because like- Everybody loves them because they're genuinely wanting to give back to mm-hmm. everybody that's involved. Like I grew up watching, like I said, Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl, face of rock and roll, ugliest human being I think in the world. But he's the face of rock and roll because he's genuine. He's down to earth, loves what he does. And he's been like the glue for all of these old time rock stars who are kind of out of it. Yeah. And now they're all like buddies again because he's kind of been the glue because <clears throat> he's just a good dude who loves what he does. You know, like yeah. a huge pro wrestling guy too, uh, Chris Jericho, one of mm-hmm. my big idols. Kind of like the reason I started this podcast. I'm like, oh, I could do more than one thing with my life because I wanted to get into broadcast journalism. I'm like, oh, I could do a podcast. I could build a brand. Mm. I could get into insurance, like, oh, a lot of money in solar. I could yeah. kind of dip my toes in all of this stuff to see what I like. And I could not just do just one thing. Right. Like, did you have a few people that you were like, man, I kind of want to model myself, like take bits For and sure. pieces. For sure, yeah. Um, a good mentor friend of mine is um, Dan Fleischman, yeah. and he's somebody who I I like to mo- I would like to model my life after. Um, he anybody who knows him really well has good things to say about him. Um, he takes care of his friends. He puts people on. He makes connections. He's super well connected. He values relationship capital on a really high level. Um, and then he has multiple businesses, all of which are successful. But he doesn't run any of them. He has operators in each of those businesses. And um, he's just always working to provide big deals, build high-level relationships, do business development on a high level. Um, And then he takes the money that he has and then goes and invests it in startups. And he's invested in over 60, angel investor in over 60 startups now. You know, so like he, he helps people at the beginning of their journey. And then he has his own companies that he has other people running that love yeah. working for and with him. Um, and then he focuses his time on doing podcasts, creating content, speaking at events, hosting his own events. Um, you know, that that's, I, I like the way that he, yeah. that he goes about doing things. And I think that my skill sets are better suited to do a version of life like that right. rather than be somebody who's like in the weeds operating one business all the time or, you know, w- whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. So um, he, he's definitely somebody that I look that I, I look up to in that regard. Oh, yeah. I'm lucky to call him a friend and mentor. Oh, yeah. He's a brilliant guy for anybody that doesn't follow him on social media. Oh, yeah. Brilliant Super dude. smart entrepreneur for sure. Like for people, and I was talking to um, – Dom about this before you got here too, just like people who, especially like I'm Christian and there's a lot of Christians out there that'll associate money with greed. Mm -hmm. It's like the more money you have, the more opportunity, not only are you providing for yourself, but for other people, because you can help other people accomplish their goals. And that's going to make you so fulfilled at the end of the day, as well as other people around you. Everybody wants to talk about how money is not everything until they need it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a Christian would say that, but then it's like, oh, well, let's go support this missionary. You it's like money. support them with what? Yeah, exactly. Like thoughts and prayers are good, but money's better. <laughs> like, no. You know what I mean? Like yeah. money's actually going to do something. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody still needs it. Just it's so weird to me that there's just the yeah, it's I mean, it's weird it's a weird culture the, out in and out of Christianity. It just, just oh, like, yeah. doesn't just doesn't doesn't follow. It doesn't make any no, sense. No. I mean, the old adage is that like your your identity is going to be exposed with more money regardless. If you're a great totally. guy- It's an you're amplifier. Gonna, everybody's going to see it. Like if you're a douche, like, oh, with money, you're going to be an even yep. bigger douche. It's like, an amplifier. It just makes it. you more of who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, but the tool in and of itself is just a tool. Yeah. It's not intrinsically good or bad. You can use a shovel to dig a hole or you use a shovel to kill somebody. 
You know what I'm saying? Like yep. it's a tool. Money is the same way. It's just a tool. Mm -hmm. You can use it to do really amazing things or you can use it to really do really crappy things. But if you don't have it, you can't use it for anything. Nope. So yeah, I'd rather have it. Yeah. And if <laughs> you have that value, you're making it anyways, right? It's not even a thought. Yeah. You know, you get to a point where like money's not even a thought because I know it's coming in because what I'm doing is valuable to people. Yeah. You know, right. it's not like if you're worrying about like, oh, I got to get this job, that job, that job in order to pay my bills every month. It's like you're kind of doing it the wrong way, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah have your money work for you. It's not easy, obviously. You have to put in the work and time to really see that vision through. Yeah. And there are going to be times where you probably think to yourself, it's not working out. Like, why am I still doing this? Still mm -hmm. go through it. Like you said at the beginning, three years, right? Yeah. Right. Th wait three years. You know, if you're still at rock bottom, you did something wrong. Yeah. You know, first right. of all, but wait three years, learn from your mistakes, adapt to, you know, certain things that are going to be adjusting in the world. Two years ago, IG reels and TikTok reels weren't a thing. Yeah. Right. Look at it now. They're taking over social media, right? Right. And in two years, it's probably going to be something different. Yeah. You just got to adapt and adapt and adapt. Yep. Stay in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep learning. I appreciate you spending uh, time with me today. Yeah, dude. Of and course. I don't know what you got going on the rest of the day, but I'll let you head out. Uh, where can we find uh, the dinner party? Is it on YouTube? The it's first on episode? YouTube. Yeah. So we, we made a mistake by never posting on youtube until yeah. this year so and i say never we YouTube's have some huge. interviews up on yeah. there uh, but we just were never posting consistently and actually trying to grow youtube until january of this year so we are now focused on that so you can find me the show at at travis makes friends on youtube uh the username at travis makes friends and then uh one of the one of the recent episodes on that channel is yeah. dinner party episode one Awesome. Yeah. And if you're not following Travis on social media, I don't know what the hell you're doing, you know, yeah, because for real, exactly. He knows it too, you know, <laughs> respectful arrogance. That's what you need in this industry. But this was episode 696 of the podcast, guys. Remember, we are brought to you by Osnap Active Lifestyle. Head on over to osnap.com slash Jack O'Hara to get your free packets. Become an ambassador with us, uh, with John Malott's crew. A lot of fun stuff happening in Scottsdale. Uh, but Travis, I appreciate you for coming on, man. For sure. Thanks for having me. Last.